Hi everyone, I'm Gertie and welcome back to my online L'Amour Dress class. If you haven't seen the previous segments of this class, please do go ahead and catch up on those. And to catch you up on what we're doing here, this is the L'Amour Dress class that was previously on my Charm School site. It was a paid course. In light of current world events, I am releasing it to you free of charge. I want you to enjoy it. I want you to stay home and sew. So please enjoy the class. Also know that a lot has changed about the pattern since I released this class. We've now released it in sizes two through 20 with A through H cup sizes, as well as adding new design elements. So check it out, buy the pattern on the Charm site, subscribe to my channel, subscribe to me on Patreon, stay healthy, Stay safe and stay home and sew, and I'll see you soon. We're on step 12 now, which is assembling the bodice lining. So you're just going to repeat steps three and four on the bodice pieces, just like you did on the outer bodice. So that means just making that pleat, sewing the two pieces together at the center front seam. And then the next thing you're gonna do is that stay stitching that goes from the top of the piece down to the lower princess seam notch on the center front piece. Okay, so let's look over here. That's my stay stitching. I'm going to create those little clips. From the top of this princess seam. Down to the lower notch. So you'll notice that this is a bit of repetition from the outer bodice same exact thing that we did on that princess seam. Now we're going to take piece four, which is the lining side front piece. We're going to put these two together on the princess seam. Okay, so right sides together. And again, you're going to just spread Spread these clips so that they match the curve of the side front piece. Okay, we're going to sew this from top to bottom with the clip side on top. Again, I'm going to notch the curved side of the princess seam. So again, I try to position those notches so that they are opposing the clips on the other side. And now we'll be able to press this open nicely. Make sure my iron's on.
got one princess seam completed. I'm just going to do the exact same thing on the other side. So again, clip those notches. Or create the clips on the center front here. And then grab your other side front. And again, I always like to have the clipped side on top when I'm doing this. And you can start by matching up the clips throughout, the smaller clips, the pattern notches that indicate where these pieces are supposed to match. Okay, so this is our second front princess seam. After I'm done with this one, the front of the bodice lining will be completed and we'll move on to the back pieces. We've sewn the front princess seams on the bodice lining. Now we're going to sew the back princess seams. So these are pieces five and six. You're going to put these together, pin them together so that the triple notches are matching and we're going to pin and then sew from top to bottom. We're going to ready to press this one open now. Okay, we're going to repeat the same thing on the other set of pieces. All right, press open. And now we're going to sew the two back pieces to the front piece at the side seams. So again, just match your notches. these together and now this is forming that strapless bodice shape just like we did on the outer bodice. And it comes together a lot more quickly when we don't have the halter strap to deal with. Okay, I did one side seam. I'm just going to go right into doing the other side seam. Now I'm going to press these side seams open once again. Okay, here we go. We have a completed bodice lining, front and back. All those princess seams are sewn and the side seams. Now in the next chapter, we're ready to go ahead and apply the boning channels. Step 15, so we are applying our boning channeling to our bodice lining. And there's a great illustration in the instructions that shows you the exact placement of all the boning channels, so you probably want to go back and refer to it. But um, the places I really like to use boning on this dress are over the front princess seam, diagonally, um, running from the neckline down to the waistline, so that supports the bust line, side seam, the back princess seam, and then uh, near the center back close to the zipper. So I'm just going to walk you through where you're going to be placing each of these on the lining. Okay, so I've got my channeling. So I'm going to start at center back 
and we have a line that you marked from the pattern piece that you should have transferred to your lining. So if you didn't, go back and check your lining piece now. It pretty much goes down the center of this back panel. So I'm just going to take the boning channeling and lay it over that marked line. And I like to pin my channels in place at this point. And I'll just use a few pins going down like this. And then the next place I'm going to put it is the back princess seam. So right here. And anytime you're placing boning channeling over a seam, you want to just center it as much as possible. Of course, that's easier said than done because once you put it down, you can't see the seam. Uh, but do your best. Center it over there. It's not something I obsess over, to be honest. But um, visually, kind of try to center it over the seam allowances. Okay, that's our second boning channel. The next one is going to be at the side seam. If you really felt like you needed a lot of support in the back, you could add one right here. I don't find it that necessary, so I just go to the side seam. I think the side seam is really important. And I mentioned this in the instructions, um, but I think it's, it's worth noting here that um, a lot of people who I've talked to over the years, they really prefer not to have channeling in their seam allowances at the top and bottom of the lining. So they will cut their seam allowances five, eight, seven, inch, I'm sorry, they will cut their channeling five, eight, seven inch short from the top and bottom and then um, close it by machine stitching. I personally have never really had a problem with the thickness of the channeling in those seam allowances. Um, I've tried it both ways, and unless a fabric is really super thick, I don't worry about that either. So that's why I'm extending mine all the way to the seam allowances, but I do like you to be aware that there's another way you can do that. Okay, here is my side panel, the side front panel, and this is that diagonal line that um, was marked on your pattern piece. So you're just going to run this from the top to the bottom here. And I will say about this, the placement of this, you just want to avoid the seam allowances as much as possible. You can kind of overlap a little bit, but you are going to have channeling on both of those seam allowances. So kind of try to clear that a little bit. The, the um, placement line is, is a guide, but um, you can kind of nudge it a little either way to avoid those seam allowances. Okay, we've got a side panel there. Next thing we're gonna do is the front princess seam. And this is the trickiest one to do just because of that curve. And I will say it, it gets trickier the um, higher you go in the cup sizes because again, that makes the seam more curved. And channeling uh, does not have any give to it. It doesn't stretch or bend around these seams. So you have to really kind of make sure that your placing it so that it's directly on that seam line and curving it just a little bit. Um, if you're really finding that it's hard to bend around that curve, you can always use bias tape. And bias tape is a good substitute for channeling in general. Um, and it's especially good for a princess seam like the front one where you have a lot of curve. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that's what we want on each side. I'm just gonna go to center front and then it would be the same thing on the other side. So now that you have these all pinned into place, we're going to edge stitch them by machine. I really recommend um, if you have an edge stitch foot, now is a great time to break it out, but you can also substitute um, a blind hem foot is very similar. Just something that has that blade down center front and then you can move your needle to either side to get a consistent edge stitch. Okay, I'm gonna head to the machine now and change my foot. I'm gonna change out my presser foot from my regular presser foot to the edge stitch. And I'm placing this first channel under there. I'm gonna position my needle just to the left of the blade on the edge stitch foot. Start from top to bottom. And so, just stitching along each edge of the channeling. And you can see that this is really where the edge stitch foot comes in handy because I don't need to be watching too closely to make sure that my stitching is straight. And now I just have to move the needle when I go to the other side. So it's the other side of the blade.
And I'm going to repeat that. I'm going to repeat that same, ed same edge stitching on all of these channels. So this part gets a little bit tedious, I will warn you, because you're just really going down all of these channels. Same thing on each one. I'm just going to move my needle. Okay, one last channel, and this is the trickiest one because, again, it's that curved seam, so just take it slow. And you kind of have to manipulate the fabric to accommodate that curve of the bust as you sew. And sometimes these little notches will get in your way, so you just raise the presser foot with the needle down, of course, and just smooth things out as you sew. I almost sewed over that side. Be careful there. Okay, so that is one side of boning channels completed. So you can see I have a lot of loose threads here. I'm just going to trim those now. And now I just need to go back and do the whole thing over again on the other side of the bodice. So but you can kind of get a sense of what this is going to look like. So I'm just going to keep going on the other side, um, five bones from this princess seam to the center back. I have a lot of, or almost all of the bodice to this side of the machine at this point, which is a little bit tricky to deal with, but it's not a huge piece of garment, so it doesn't bother me that much, and I prefer to be able to place all my pins in the same direction and stitch in the same direction, but if that doesn't work for you, feel free to turn this around as you go. That's totally fine. This is just my preferred way of doing it after having done many of these strapless bodices. So, okay, we have a fully channeled bodice lining. This is our last step in this chapter. So in the next chapter, we're going to move on to putting the outer bodice and the bodice lining together as one. Welcome back everyone. Today we are starting with step 16 and this is where you sew the outer bodice, which you've constructed to the inner bodice. And this step is near and dear to my heart. This is a technique that I love. It's a little difficult to explain, especially in instructions on the printed pattern. So I was really excited to make this video because I really wanted to show you how I do this step because it makes such a difference in how your lap zipper will look on the inside of your dress with the lining. So um, I was thinking of a technique, or what to call this technique when I was writing the instructions, and um, I really wanted to call it something like Gertie's signature lap zipper or something like that, but we settled on a clean finish lap zipper with lining. So that is the catchy phrase for this technique, 
and I hope you love it. I did not invent this technique. I read this in Threads Magazine, which is one of my favorite sewing resources. They talked about doing this with a facing, and I've tweaked the technique a little bit for my purposes, for the designs that I do, and have really worked on perfecting it over the years. So I hope you like this as much as I do. Okay, so let's take a look at this dress that's on the mannequin. This has the lap zipper inserted, so you can see the left side of the dress is the overlap, right? That has this sort of flap of fabric right here. The right side of the dress, as you're looking at it, and from here on out when I refer to left or right, it's as you're looking at the dress. Okay, so left is the overlap, right is the underlap. That's if I fold this back, I can see the underlap portion here. Now I just want to show you, if I open the zipper and fold this back, this is where the lining, that white cotton is the lining. And so you can see that it folds slightly in from the dress, from the overlap, which allows it to cleanly clear the zipper right here. The problem with lap zippers a lot of time is when you have the facing or the lining, if you do it, um, if you sew it as you normally would with a facing or a lining and a regular zipper, the lining gets turned and ends up covering the zipper. And then you have to kind of squish this in to avoid um, having it cover the zipper and it looks really messy on the inside. So that's why we call this a clean finish. Okay, so that's all we're going to be doing, but I will warn you that there are lots of measurements involved here. Um, if you forget any of them, please refer back to the printed instructions, but it looks complicated the first time you do it, but once you memorize these steps, it's really not a big deal. So I'm very excited to show you this. You're going to grab your outer bodice, your lining, and go to your ironing board with um, a ruler, a clear ruler, or a little um, seam gauge, and we're going to get started. The first thing I'm going to do is take my lining and I'm going to put it down on the ironing board with the right side up. Okay, so right side is facing you. You don't see the boning channels. Next thing I'm going to do is take my outer dress and put it right sides together with the lining. So I'm just going to lay them together here on the ironing board. And so the wrong side of the dress is facing me, but the two are right sides together. Okay. So next thing I want to do is pin them at the side seams. So match up your side seams. Just put a pin in there just to make sure that everything stays aligned in these next few steps. Same thing on the other side. I'm going to find my side seam, match it to this side seam. And at this point, it's not a bad idea to check that everything is matching up, that your lining and your dress got cut the same size. Okay, so what we're looking at right now is the back of the dress facing up. I have the lining on top with the wrong side facing me. And then inside, I have the dress with the right side facing me because I just flipped the backs in like this. So we're looking at the back of the dress, which is how we want to work for these next steps. Okay, this is where I'm gonna start throwing some measurements at you. On the right side of the dress, grab both backs together, okay, I have the dress and the lining. And then at the upper neckline up here, I'm going to take both of these seam allowances and turn them towards me, towards the lining, half an inch. Okay, so I'm gonna use my clear ruler I love my clear ruler. I use it for everything. I'm going to make sure that these are both half an inch. Okay, and I'm just going to kind of finger press here, but you can also, I'm going to bring in my little polka dot ham, and I can press these together half an inch. Okay, so I just want to be really clear about what I have going on here. It's the outer dress right, with those polka dots, and then the lining. So the way I refer to these is that these are now nested together because they are both folded as one to the lining, okay, towards you. And now you're gonna pin these. And I also wanna be really clear that I'm just working at the top of the dress for now. You don't need to worry about um, pressing or pinning anything from here down. I really just need one pin on this side. Okay, so two seam allowances nested together, folded towards you at half an inch. Okay, let's work on the other side. Now this side gets a little confusing because the lining and the dress get folded out different measurements. Okay, so the work on the lining independently, okay, folded away from the dress, 
this is going to get folded towards you again. Say everything gets folded the same direction, okay? So don't think that you're folding seam allowances in different directions, they all go the same way. Okay, so this seam allowance, the lining seam allowance, gets folded out 7 eighths of an inch. And I'm sorry if you're a metric person, but this is how I have to do it. Okay, 7 eighths of an inch. And I found that even American people sometimes don't know how to measure this. So this is the clear ruler, seven little blocks on the clear ruler. All right, I am going to press that one at seven eighths of an inch. Just at the top. And then the dress seam allowance, I'm going to fold in and press five eighths of an inch. So your normal seam allowance. Okay, press that in, and I'm going to trim away these little threads on the underlining because they're making me crazy. Okay, so let's just review that. Lining seam allowance, 7 eighths of an inch. Dress seam allowance, 5 eighths of an inch. So if everything is smooth over here, from the side seam on, and you can kind of match your princess seam here if that helps you smooth these two out. What you should be seeing is a quarter inch gap between this crease and the crease of the dress, okay? And that quarter inch gap is what's going to create that effect on the inside of the dress where the lining clears the zipper and is folded in slightly in, a quarter inch from the zipper. Okay, so I'm going to put two pins on this side to hold both those seam allowances in place. So I just want to review real quickly what I did here because again, I know this is a little complicated, but it's one of my favorite things to teach just because I feel like it really gives you a very satisfying, beautiful effect. Okay, on the right side of the dress, this is the underlap side of the zipper, we've pressed both seam allowances out half an inch, okay? And they're nested inside each other, the dress and the lining. On the left side of the dress, the lining is pressed out 7 eighths of an inch, and then the dress is pressed out the same direction, 5 eighths of an inch, resulting in that quarter inch gap between the two. And I've only put pins at the neckline here. I haven't even pressed further down from the neckline, okay? So I'm referring to this as the back neckline, even though that seems funny because it's kind of midway down your back. Okay, next thing I'm going to do is pin all the way around from, at this point, I've only really pinned at the side seams and this princess seam. So our next step is actually to sew around the neckline, which is really exciting because these two are going to be connected finally and start really looking like a dress, have a finished neckline and all of that. So I'm putting pins all the way around like this. I put my pins with the heads up here so I can pull them out easily as I'm sewing. Let's go to the front. Very important, you wanna make sure that you're matching all of your seams on the dress and the lining. So this is my center front sweetheart point. I'm gonna go, I often like to match up my seams first when I'm pinning things and then sort of fill in the gaps between them. I don't know about you, but for me, matching seams when I'm sewing is one of the most challenging things and I find that I have to redo things a few times on a bad day. Okay, I now have pins all the way around my neckline. The next thing I'm going to do is go to the sewing machine and we're going to sew all the way from one back upper neckline all the way to the other side. So I want to show you how this is sewn just to be very clear about how you deal with those folds at the beginning and end of your stitching. We are ready to stitch our neckline. I'm going to change back to my standard presser foot. I still have my edge stitch foot on from doing those boning channels. So go back to your regular presser foot at this point. Okay, I'm going to start, I'm starting at the right back 
neckline. So that's where I folded those seam allowances towards the lining half an inch. So one thing I want to be really clear about here is that you start at the very edge of that fold. Um, I've noticed students in my workshops will kind of, because of that fold confuses them and they start a little ways in, like a quarter inch or something like that, um, which I totally understand that instinct because it looks different from anything that you've done before. But if you do that, you will have a little hole at the top of your dress. So I want you to be very careful that you are starting exactly on the fold of fabric, just how you would sew any other seam. You have to sew from the very beginning. All right, so a couple stitches and then back stitch. Okay, so I'm sewing over those folds right now. I'm sewing at five eighths of an inch using my regular stitch length. And you kind of have to monitor the dress on the underside to make sure that your seam allowances don't flip up. I mean, it's not a huge deal to go back and fix those if they do, but it's nice to not have to. And also you want to make sure that the diagonal seam allowance stays pressed down. Don't forget to take out your pins. And just, I want to note real quickly that the halter straps are doing their own thing. They're kind of pressed down between the layers, so don't even worry about those right now. And you will get to the point where the halter strap is inserted, where it's going to feel a little bumpy underneath there. And you are stitching, and you should be stitching very close to where the halter strap starts. So it's going to feel a little bumpy underneath there. Just go with it. And again, watch those seam allowances that they're staying pressed where they're supposed to. And sometimes I like to just stop and make sure that everything is arranged how it's supposed to be. Now I'm sewing, I'm getting close to the sweetheart neckline point right now. So you want to be really careful with your seam allowance here. I'm being very, very conscientious to stay at my 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance. And then I'm going to pivot. But you want to pivot exactly at that sweetheart point. So at the seam line, the center front seam, I'm going to stop with my needle down, lift my presser foot, and then pivot. So if you want to kind of double check yourself, you want to make sure that you're at 5 eighths of an inch on your seam allowance after you pivot this way. Okay, that was the halfway point. Same thing on this side. making sure everything stays where it's supposed to be. If you get little puckers like that, just stop, lift up the presser foot with the needle down always and smooth everything out. I often, I don't, I never pull and I always tell my students not to pull anything or push anything through, push anything through the machine because that's what the feed dogs do. But I do hold things very taut at some points, especially, and you'll see when we sew the zipper to avoid getting puckers, it can be really important to hold things from the back like this and from the front so you're creating a really smooth surface. Okay, we're getting to our second set of folds on the other side of the zipper opening. And so I just want to make sure that you are stitching all the way to the fold, okay? And that's where you're back stitching and ending. Okay. So I've stitched all the way right up to that edge. Okay, so I've stitched all the way around the neckline, both sides of those folds. And in the next chapter, I'm gonna come back and we're gonna grade and clip our seam allowance so that we get a nice flat finish on the outside. We are back, we are in 
the middle of step 17, the last thing we did was to stitch all the way around the neckline, and now we're going to continue on that step with the trimming, grading, clipping, and notching around the neckline. And I am just going to beg you not to skimp on these steps because these they seem like really mundane things to do, and they are, but these make such a difference in how your finished neckline is going to look. So we're gonna do that, then we're gonna go on to understitching. We're gonna even up the waistline, and I'll explain more about that when we get to it. And then in the next chapter, we'll be ready to move on to cutting our spiral steel boning, okay? So I am gonna to get to my flat surface here, and I'm, I have my good scissors. And the first thing I want to do is trim away these corners, okay? So think about this just like if you were sewing. Maybe when you first started sewing, you made a tote bag or something like that, or a pillowcase, something where you had a corner, and then you needed to trim away from that corner so that when you turned it right side out, you got a nice crisp corner. And that's exactly what we're doing here. And you can kind of get a sense of what's gonna happen once we turn this right side out here. Okay, so on both sides of this opening here, you are going to trim diagonally. Okay, that's the first step. Next step is that we're going to grade the seam allowances. Now your lining seam allowance should always be the shorter one. Okay, so I'm going to start by trimming all the way around, I'm gonna trim my lining seam allowance down. And I usually say this is, should be somewhere between an eighth of an inch and a quarter of an inch, okay? So keep it somewhere around there. And one trick I like to use is to hold my scissors slightly at an angle towards me, which kind of, when you're trimming something kind of thick, like those boning channels, that means that you get, you naturally get a sort of beveled edge. It doesn't cut off really bluntly. Okay, I'm coming to my sweetheart neckline and we will be trimming away from there in just a little bit. But for now, I want you to focus on just cutting that lining seam allowance down. I'm coming up to the other side here where I clip diagonally into that corner. Trim away there. All right, that's our first seam allowance graded. The next one we're going to do is the dress seam allowance. So anytime you're grading a seam allowance, just remember that the garment seam allowance should be the longest one. And I could explain to you why that is. It's really geeky, but the reason is that when you turn everything right side out, the longer seam allowance should be the one closest to the garment, which would be the garment itself, and it will kind of shield the shorter seam allowance. And that's what creates a grade of the seam allowances. I know a lot of my students really like to know why something is done the way it is, and other people could care less. They just want to know how to do it. And again, we've got a couple layers here. We have the underlining and the outer dress fabric, so not a bad idea to use that trick of angling your scissors towards you as you trim, just to create more of a bevel. Okay, I'm back at the beginning here. Okay, we've graded our seam allowances. The next thing I want to do is to go to that sweetheart point. This is very important. If you don't clip all the way down to the sweetheart point and trim away a little bit from that notch, you will get some puckers and bunches at your center front, and we do not want that because that is the focal point. Okay, so clip into that seam allowance just a little bit between those two seam allowances. 
and then at the V point there you're going to trim away from either side creating a little notch or a V. Okay. And another thing I will say here is this is where having quality shears is so important. Um, I have watched in horror as students have had to go like this, hacking away um, with dull scissors, and it just really scares me because I don't want you to cut into your dress. So um, if you have scissors that are strong enough and sharp enough to really cut into a point here, that's what you want. And um, there are scissors also called tailor's points, which are shorter scissors, which are very strong um, and thick, and they work well for this job too. But I find that these scissors by Kai, which are my favorite and the only ones I use at this point, they are sharp and strong enough for this purpose. Okay, we trimmed away a little notch at our sweetheart point. The next thing we're gonna do is, this is an outer curve. Anytime you have an outer curve on a seam allowance, you want to notch it. I'm saying notch, um, meaning those little triangles that we make as opposed to the clips, which are just those straight snips. So outer curves, you always notch, inner curves, you clip. On the sweetheart point, we have a curve that goes up towards the princess line, which gives us that beautiful rounded neckline on the bust. And we want to make sure that it lays flat when we turn it to the right, wrong side, excuse me. So we're gonna do some notches from the sweetheart point up. And this is where it's gonna look like you threw confetti everywhere in your sewing room because these little, tiny little notches, they go everywhere. Okay, so another place that you might wanna do a little bit of clipping is under the arm over here. I might just do a couple clips. It kind of curves down a little bit. That's from this point down to the underarm. You have a little bit of an inner curve. Not very extreme, so don't worry too much about it, but just do a few clips there. Okay, and the back, the upper back neckline is straight across, so we don't need to worry about doing any clipping or notching there because there's no curve. Okay, so just to review what we did there, we trimmed, we graded, the lining seam allowance is the shorter one, the dress is the longer one. We did a notch at the sweetheart point, and I am obsessing a little bit about this one. I wanna get back in there a little bit and make sure I trimmed away enough. So you really wanna have a nice notch here, but be very careful not to clip into your stitching. And then I did some notches around the rounded point of the sweetheart neckline and a few clips around the dip on the underarm. The next thing we're gonna do is understitch. And I love understitching. I've heard a lot of my students say that this is one of their favorite things to do while sewing. Um, first of all, I would say do not press the neckline before you understitch. I always press afterwards. And the reason for that is the understitching gives you a nice um, hard edge to press the neckline in. And you'll see a little bit what, more what I mean when we get there. So let's go over to the machine and we are going to understitch this neckline. Understitching. So first thing I want you to do is kind of pull out the lining from the bodice and then make sure that you turn those little corners at either side of the back neckline out and get a nice crisp corner going there. Do the same thing on the other side. Okay, so we've got two nice little corners going on there. Okay, you've opened the two out from each other. So I've got my dress fabric and then my lining fabric. I'm going to switch my presser foot back to my edge stitching foot. I really like to use this for under stitching because I can get a nice consistent line um, that, is an, that is equidistant from the seam line to my stitching. But it's not necessary and this is something that you can kind of eyeball too. So um, if you like to use an edge stitch foot or the blind hem foot in its place, put that on now. And you're gonna kind of position, and one thing I will say is that the little clean finish that we did at the upper neckline makes it a little bit difficult to understitch. And one thing that I would recommend doing is just getting in here and clipping the seam allowances once next to the seam allowance on the insides, which will allow you to turn the seam allowance towards the lining, okay? So it's just a little clip right there. 
and I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. Just real close to that seam allowance. I'm just doing a straight clip into the seam allowances so that I can manipulate those seam allowances towards the lining for my understitching. All right, I'm going to place this and underneath the presser foot. And for understitching with that clean finish that we did, I always start just a little bit in, sort of past my seam allowance, okay? So I'd say I'm starting about half an inch in from the edge here. And I'm going to change my needle position so that it's about an eighth of an inch to the right of the seam line. And then I'm gonna start stitching. And what I'm doing here is that I'm stitching on the lining. I'm making sure that my seam allowances are pressed toward the lining so that as I'm stitching, I'm catching the lining and the seam allowances underneath. Okay, so I'm effectively stitching the seam allowances to the lining. And one thing I really like to do as I'm under stitching, and I'm stitching about an eighth of an inch away. Um, that's a little wide now that I'm looking at it. Um, you might want to get a little bit further in, but since I've started, I'm going to keep going with this. Um, you really want to make sure that you hold everything nice and smooth as you're under stitching. You want to really kind of stretch it so that you're exposing the seam line and that everything is nice and taut. I just want to note also here that throughout the video I've been using a darker green thread than my fabric just so that it shows up so that you can see it but obviously you're going to want to match your thread a little bit better than I have. Okay, I'm at the sweetheart point right now. This is, again is a bit of a pivot point, so you can stop with your needle down, smooth everything out, and then continue sewing. And again, I just wanna keep rearranging the seam allowances underneath. so that they are pressed towards the lining and then I'm catching them in my stitching. And I'm stitching over my boning channeling now and that's where things get a little bit bulky, but I don't find it too prohibitively bulky, but like I said, some people, that's why they like to trim their boning channels short of the seam allowances. But for this dress, I do not feel like it's a problem. Okay, we're almost to the other side. I'll stitch as far as I can on the lining here. This is where it ends a little bit short because of that clean finish technique. And here we go. Okay, so the first thing that you'll notice now is that you'll be able to turn the lining in nice and cleanly around the upper edge. So we're gonna take this over to the ironing board and really get a nice clean press on the upper neckline. We've just understitched, now I'm back at the ironing board and I'm going to press that neckline. So what I want you to do is really roll the understitching out, I kind of use a motion like this, pressing my fingers this way, so that you really roll the neckline as far as it, it will go. But what the understitching has done is it allows the neckline, I'm sorry, the lining to roll slightly inward so that it's not gonna show from the outside and you have that nice clean press on the outside. Isn't this satisfying? 
Okay, so you're going to press from the inside using that rolling motion that I talked about with your hand. Press the neckline. You can use a little steam here if you like, and you're going to go all the way around. I like to use the ham for this just because I feel like it helps me to do this on a raised surface. And also because we are pressing a curve in here, it does make sense. You know, this is a curved neckline. It does make sense not to do it flat because you don't want to press the curve out of your neckline. And if you don't have a ham, shame on you, go buy one right now. It's very important for garment sewing. And so I think even from your first dress or skirt, anything that has a dart in it, you should be pressing on a ham. Though I have heard that in a pinch, a rolled up towel will work too, but I really like the hard surface of this ham. And if you can find a polka dot one, then bonus points. So again, you can use a little steam here. Okay, I'm all the way to the other side now. So just a little bit of steam. Okay, I'm pressed all the way around. And let's just see how nice our neckline looks, that beautiful sweetheart neckline looking great. The next thing we're gonna do in this chapter, it's the final thing, is that we are going to trim, if necessary, the waistline of our lining. And what I mean by that is that now that the lining is rolled in slightly, sometimes it can get longer than the outer garment. So what I want you to do is go all the way around and really smooth things out, okay? Make sure that the layers are all flat and put pins kind of throughout as necessary. And especially on the front pin princess seams, I want you to really smooth the two layers together. And here you can pin along the seams. And on this fabric, I'm really seeing, see how my lining is about half an inch longer than my dress right now. So on some garments, I really notice it. On, on different fabrics, I've noticed it. On thinner fabrics, um, it can be very minor, the difference that you're seeing. And sometimes you won't see a difference at all. It, kinda, it depends on the fabric that you're using, um, the boning channels, how thick they are. Um, so you're, we're just evening everything up at the waistline so that when we turn everything in and hand stitch the waistline, lining, things aren't mismatched. So again, I'm just smoothing these layers out, the pins throughout. On the back, um, everything's much flatter on the back, so you can, you don't have to be quite as meticulous about going down along those princess seams like you do in the front where they're really curved. And I'm just gonna kind of double check my work here. Just making sure that these are matching up. Okay, good. All right, now turn it the other way. And here you can really see the unevenness at the bottom here. And this is what I'm gonna trim away. Now in the back where it's flat, there's not as much of a difference. In the front, it's more significant. So I'm just trimming the lining away so that it's even with the dress waistline. Okay, so now I have two, get this out of the way. I have two layers that are exactly even with each other. And this is a step that I found was really important. Um, I, I've never seen this described in any other instructions anywhere, but I found that when I was working on my dress book, Gertie's Ultimate Dress Book, I found that I was doing a lot of strapless bodices and I was really noticing some significant differences in the lengths after I did the understitching. So that's when I devised this step 
for all of my strapless bodices because you don't want things to be uneven once you turn them to the inside of the dress. Because then the lining, once you add the boning, you're gonna, it's gonna cause all sorts of problems, just trust me. You're gonna add the line, you're gonna add the boning to the lining and you're going to cut it longer than it would than the outer bodice. So then it's gonna be kind of poking out the top neckline. So that's why this step is so important. Okay, easy peasy, but a very important one. Okay, we have an even waistline on the dress and the lining. And that's the end of this chapter. We're gonna go on to adding the spiral still boning next. ready to add the spiral steel boning to our linings. So this is a really exciting step. You get to work with metal, you get to work with heavy tools, um, and it's really fun to do once you get the hang of it. Okay, so I have my bodice out here um, lining side up. I have all my supplies for boning, and I know that all of you are probably giggling at home as I say boning a million times in this chapter, and my students still do it in my workshops, so I totally understand if that's what you're doing, but I'm gonna say boning like 20, 80 more times. Okay, so you have your spiral steel boning. I'm gonna be working with these um, pre-cut 18 inch lengths. You might have your continuous length, which is what I recommend getting for this dress, but just for um, the sake of time today, I'm gonna use these ones that have the two finished ends because then I can just make a cut, finish one end. But you will understand the technique from watching me do this. So you will have to finish both ends if you bought the continuous roll of spiral steel. Okay, I'm gonna be showing you how to do this with Teflon tape. So you've got your Teflon tape, and then I also am gonna show you how to do one of these um, uh, boning end caps on this. So I have those, I have my pliers, I have my metal cutters, and just have a ruler handy. Okay, so let's start with one of our um, boning channels, the one that's closest to center back here. I'm gonna grab one of my bones, you're gonna grab your length of boning, and I'm just going to kind of determine what length it needs to be by kind of placing it right underneath the understitching here because it's not gonna be able to go any further than the understitching. And it can't go any further than 5 eighths of an inch down here because that's the seam allowance. But you also wanna give yourself a little more wiggle room down here because we're gonna be adding um, some sort of tip to this. And then also just for turn of cloth and all that, you don't want it to be too tight in there. So I would say um, give yourself another quarter inch from there. So that's about seven eighths there. So um, seven eighths from the bottom, the raw edge of the lining. Okay, now I'm going to, I've kind of marked that spot with my thumbnail. And now I'm gonna take my metal cutters. And what you do is you cut one side of each of one of these spirals. So I just use the very edge of these clippers and make one little nip like that. And then turn it over and do the same thing on the other side, just one little nip. Okay, so they come apart very easily um, if you just make tiny little cuts on either side. If you try to go like this, it will probably never come apart. And that's what I did on the first video I ever made where I showed how to cut boning because I didn't understand that little method of making those little nips on either side. So that's the easiest way to do it. It should come apart pretty easily if you do it that way. And once you've cut one for this channel, go ahead and do the same thing for the channel on the other side um, because they should be the same length, right? Okay, so I'm gonna make one. Also this length, again, cut on that side, turn it over. Okay, so this bit I'm just gonna get rid of. And you can see now I have, um, because I used those pre-cut lengths, that's funny, one ended up a little longer. Let me correct this really quickly. There we go. <laughs> and it flew across the room, okay. Um, so now I have two that are the same lengths, finished on one end, you're pro if you use the continuous boning, you'll have um, four um, raw edges on your boning. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna finish these edges. Okay, so first method I'm gonna show you is using these 
these little metal end caps that are intended for this very purpose, but that I honestly don't like very much because I feel like they're very hard to get on here and stay on here. But I want to show you, just in case this is what you have. Okay, I'm going to kind of flatten that out first. So you just put that end cap on, and then with the pliers, you squeeze that way and then flat. And it's not on at all. See, this is my problem with these. Some people will use two sets of pliers at the same time. The method that I've finally found that works is actually crimping with my metal cutters. And it looks terrible, but it does stay on. So I'll just crimp, really press all the way down. But now it's on, okay? But see how it's kind of flaring out there? I don't really love the look of that. It's very bulky. But that is one way to finish the ends, okay? And now this is ready to insert into this channeling. So again, remember that the boning channeling is an actual tube. You can open it up and that, that tube there is where you want to insert the boning. Make sure that you're not accidentally placing it underneath the entire channel. Okay, so there's one. I'm going to show you now my favorite method, which is the plumbing tape or Teflon tape method. Okay, here we're just going to roll off about two inches of this Teflon tape. About like that. And then I'm going to hold the tape and I'm going to place the boning so that it comes about halfway up the width of the tape. And then I'm going to start rolling this so that the tape wraps around the boning. And then when I've got about half an inch left, I'm going to turn under that excess right there and then finish it off neatly. And the cool thing about Teflon tape is that it kind of squishes in on itself and it um, adheres to itself. It's not sticky like scotch tape or anything, but it does kind of hang on to itself. Okay, so that's the method for finishing with a Teflon tape. I find it much less bulky and it's a nice look. So that's what I'm going to use on the rest of these. This is the one that I cut to length for the other side. So you're going to insert that into the channel here. Henry's kind of making an appearance down here. We'll see if he jumps up. I know Henry is, is famous from many years of being on the internet, so I feel like people would be happy if he jumps up here. Okay, you're going to continue all the way around like this, measuring making sure that you're about seven eighths of an inch from the bottom from that raw edge on the waistline. When you cut, you're going to just as delicately as possible. Oops, I lost my ruler now as delicately as possible. Cut either side. There we go. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then you're going to cut the same thing. So we're cutting a pair for each one because there should be the identical twin bone on the other side of the bodice. There we go. Oh, and that one just came right off. Okay, so that's my waist right there. And I'm just going to keep going around like this. As you can see, this is this takes a little bit of time, but I really love this step for some reason, so I always get really into it. Um, but you're going to be cutting bones for each of these channels. Um, you have 10 channels total, so 10 bones. You're going to wrap all your ends and insert them into the tubes. And I'm just going to keep working here.
last bone I'm putting in, this one goes into the princess seam on the front, and these are always very satisfying because you can really see the bodice taking shape here because of that boning. So looking amazing. The next thing we're gonna do, all those bones are in their channels, next thing we're gonna do is a line of stay stitching around the waist just on the lining because that is gonna do two things. It's going to hold the bones in place not and rather than slipping out as you're working, but it's also going to be our line of guide stitching for when we turn in the waistline on the lining and stitch it in place after the skirt is on. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is to open out the lining from the dress. We're just working on the lining right now. I'm also gonna change my presser foot to a zipper foot because we want to be very careful not to stitch on the steel boning. You will break your needle, it will be scary. So to avoid that, use a zipper foot and then position your needle so that it's closer to the boning. And you're gonna stitch at 5 eighths of an inch if you've moved your needle though, remember that your seam allowance isn't, is gonna be changed now. So I always like to just check myself here with a clear ruler. And yeah, I moved it an eighth of an inch. So I'm going to adjust my seam allowance accordingly to make sure that I am stitching at five eighths of an inch. Okay, and again, I just wanna stress that I'm only stitching through my lining right now. I'm not stitching this to the dress fabric. And my zipper foot is helping me clear the boning, but I also wanna, sometimes if I'm a little unsure, I just use my hand wheel to go over those channels to make sure that I'm not going to hit any metal underneath there. And also you can kind of make sure before you get to the boning channels that your boning is pushed all the way up as far as it can go inside the channel. You can see where I trimmed here uh, the waistline and I didn't do a very even job. I'm sure you're noticing as I'm stitching this. Um, so one thing I, I would say about that is I usually use a rotary cutter to do that just to get a nice clean swipe, but um, I, did, I was not on a mat at the moment when I did that. So please excuse my jagged edges there. We've stay stitched all the way around the lining waistline. So if you like, the next thing you can do is go over to your ironing board and just press that under so that the stay stitching rolls to the inside. And then this will be all fully prepped for when we're ready to hand stitch this. Okay, so just go over and press that now. I'm gonna let you do that on your own. And then we're gonna come back in the next chapter and start working on the skirt. So. Very exciting, this is looking like a real dress and you can see with the boning in there in conjunction with um, the underlining on the outer bodice, we've got a really nice supported bodice and I always like to say that I like to make bodices that stand up on their own. And let's see if this one does, kind of. Okay, all right, I'll see you in the next chapter.